Uh, there'll be two recordings. Uh, Lao Ming will be recording as, as well as me, just in case we have one of us with connection problems. Yeah. Okay. I think people are still coming in. So let's um, wait for one, one minute. Yeah, so you're not affected by the heat wave on the West Coast at all, right? I hear all the people- No, well, here. we've had we've yeah. had a little heat wave on the East Coast, but not quite as bad as in Seattle. <laughs> that's good, that's good. And coronavirus is uh, pretty much under control in Boston or is it not so great? Seems like it, yeah. I don't, you know, we'll see if things change, but MIT is planning to go back to everything in person in the fall. Wow, that's great. Yeah, we we have all the contingency plans to do everything by remote. And uh, yeah, our semester starts a little earlier. So we start in uh, August. So uh, we're ramping up the preparations for that. Uh, okay, maybe uh, we can get started. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, so today uh, is my absolute, uh, absolute pleasure to uh, uh, Professor uh, Jacob Anders. Uh, so, uh, so Jacob is, uh, is the ex-consortium -con uh, uh, assistant professor at MIT. His uh, research focus on building intelligence system that can communicate efficiently with uh, using language and learn from human guidance. Uh, so Jacob uh, earned his PhD from UC Berkeley, his master from Cam uh, Cambridge and a bachelor's degree from uh, uh, Columbia. Uh, has been the recipient of a uh, Sony Faculty Innovation Award, uh, an MIT uh, a Teaching Award and a paper awards at NACO and ICML. So uh, today he will give us a talk about his uh, recent work uh, implicit representations of meaning in uh, neural language models. I'm really uh, excited about his talk. Uh, please all join me uh, in welcome jo uh, Jacob and uh, enjoy his talk. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> Great, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, let me share my screen right now. Good, um, I think I'm not gonna be able to see the chat while it's going on. So I guess I'll just say up front, uh, Young Ming, if you want to interrupt me with- uh, Yeah, yeah, from okay. I, I will help you keep, keep um, yeah. But, you know, please do feel free to ask questions throughout the talk rather than saving them for the end. Um, cool. So what I wanted to talk today is some work that we've been doing recently on trying to understand um, sort of in a broad sense, what it is possible to learn or what, you know, sort of modern uh, neural language modeling machinery can learn about linguistic meaning uh, when it's just trained on text alone. Um, and I'll say this is a paper that's going to appear with the, the same title as this talk that's going to appear at ACL. Uh, this year in a couple of months. Um, so to sort of motivate what we're going to be talking about today, here is an example of a little passage um, originally actually taken from Eugene Charniak's PhD thesis in 1972, but they made a reappearance in, a, a reappearance, um, in an article by, uh, by Marcus and Davis last year. Um, yeah. Start with the following paragraph. Uh, Janie went to the store to get presents for Jack. Janet said, I will buy Jack a top. Don't get Jack a top, said Penny. He has a top. He will dot, dot, dot. Actually, yeah. And if we take this paragraph. I, I, I will off a video of last, like. I... Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, if we take this paragraph of context and we hand it, hand it to a sort of state-of-the-art language model here, a GPT-3 language model that's trained. Um, oh, no, my thing is not working. Trained effectively on, you know, on the entire internet. Uh, to do next word prediction and tasks like this, um, this machine learning model completes the passage in the following way. It says, he will get a talk, I will get a talk, I will get Jack a talk, said Janet. Um, now this completion is remarkable for several reasons, right? Um, it, there's a lot about it that's really good. It knows who the participants are in this conversation. It knows that the sort of general subject of the discourse is getting Jack a top. It remembers the names of people that have been mentioned, even you know, sort of many sentences back. Uh, it knows enough about social conventions and enough about the structure of dialogues uh, to know that Janet is the one who's likely to speak next in this interaction. Um, so a lot of sort of long-term structure that you know I think as recently as like five years ago. Uh, many of us who worked on these kinds of problems didn't think 
it was realistic to expect out of uh, language models just sort of trained on text alone, whether neural or count based or anything else. On the other hand, uh, the other important thing about this passage is that it's total nonsense, right? That, uh, you know, uh, Janet just says, I will buy Jack a top. Penny says, don't get him a top. Uh, and the response is, he has a top, he will get a top, right? It doesn't make sense. Uh, this is not a sort of plausible sequence of sentences that any two people having a real conversation would actually say to each other. So there's clearly a lot about, uh, you know, sort of meaning in language and structure in language that's also not captured by current models, or at least not showing up in the completions that we're able to get out of models right now. Um, and so the big question that we're going to, you know, sort of try to ask in this talk, or try to answer in this talk, um, is, is exactly this, is that, you know, are when these models are doing things well, they, when models are doing things well, are they doing things well because they're actually building sort of explicit representations of meaning and modeling the mental states of participants in a discourse? Um, or are they just sort of shallow models of surface statistics? And that's what explains both our successes and our failures here. Um, and you know, just to sort of very briefly be explicit about the kinds of models we're gonna be working with, uh, today, these are transformer language models uh, that, broadly speaking, you know, have a series of attention mechanisms. Uh, you know, I have a sort of layer in this model that looks at, uh, sits above a single token in the sentence, looks at all the other words in the sentence, and produces some sort of contextualized representation of that token. And then at the next layer of this model, we have another attention mechanism, looks at all these contextualized tokens, produces another contextualized representation for every word, and so on. Um, and you know, probably most of us who work in NLP have seen these models before, but really a lot of the techniques that we're going to be talking about today could be applied just as easily uh, to other language models other than transformer language models, um, but these are the ones that work right now. So these are the ones that we're gonna be analyzing uh, for, for the moment. Okay. Um, why my buttons are not working here. Okay, um, so our high level goal today is to look for representations of meaning in these sort of vector representations that are getting computed by our neural language models. And if we're gonna do this, we need to start by having some notion of uh, what meanings actually looks like and right, what it would mean for a neural network model or really for any kind of language processing system to actually build explicit representations of meaning in the course of uh, solving an expert prediction task like this. Um, and so here's a sort of cartoon uh, of the theory of meaning that we're going to use to guide our exploration of these models. Um, when we have a sentence like Janet went to the store to get Jack a top, we're going to imagine that that sentence sort of constructs a possible state that the world might be in. Right, that when I say Janet went to the store to get Jack a top, that tells me that there's some entity in the world that's a store, there's some other entity in the world that's Janet, another entity that's Jack, another entity that's the top that they're trying to get for Jack, um, and there's some sort of getting event that relates all of these things to each other. And in particular, when we say Janet went to the store to get Jack a top, what we're saying is that there's this getting event whose location is the store, whose agent is Janet, whose beneficiary is Jack, whose theme is the top, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, so far this looks like uh, the kinds of models in formal semantics that we often think about when we do semantic parsing for, you know, running database queries or things like this. I have some little, you know, graph structure, relational structure that I can think of as encoding the meaning of this sentence. But once we start to think about language models, and once we start to think about sort of discourses and coherence relations between sentence, sentences, we're going to need to do something slightly different. Um, oh, I guess before we do that, I'll just note here, um, what's important about this picture is not just uh, what we've sort of explicitly drawn here, but also what we've not drawn, right? So there are properties about this top that we don't know. We don't know what color it is. We don't know whether Jack already has the top. Um, and so we're gonna think of this as this sort of graph structure that we have here as representing our current belief about the state of the world, the sort of things that we know to be true based on what's been said in this dialogue so far or in, in this discourse so far. Um, and what's gonna be important is that as we add sentences to this discourse, we're gonna think of these sentences as modifying this underlying structured representation of the state of the world. So if I start with the sentence, Janet went to the story to get Jack a top, and then I append to that the sentence, Jack already has a colorful top, 
we're going to think of that as updating this graph structure by introducing an additional node that you know represents to an additional top entity uh, that corresponds to the top that Jack already has uh, and that has you know a colorful property associated with it um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and you know, similarly, we can think of other actions as specifying other action, uh, other updates to this relational structure. For example, uh, if we say Janet went to the store to get Jack a top, she gave it to him. We're going to think of that uh, giving event as having as its consequence, uh, you know, not just a sort of structured representation like this, like we had before, but also as introducing an edge between Jack and the top that Janet just bought. That says that as a result of Janet giving him the top, Jack now possesses the top. And this is an important distinction between what we normally do in sort of normal semantic parsing applications, because this possession relationship, right, the fact that after Janet gives Jack a top, Jack possesses a top, um, is not something that's ever stated explicitly in the text here. But it's a sort of semantically necessary consequence of the conversation or of, of the discourse that went before. Um, and for this reason, we're going to add this to the graph. So in general, we're going to think of the meanings of sentences as specifying updates to these sort of underlying structured representations of the state of the world. And importantly, these updates are going to include sort of all of the necessary, all of the semantically necessary consequences of the events that take place, and not just those things that are explicitly stated in text. Um, okay, so we said that this was a sort of cartoon of how a theory of meaning might work. Um, and I'll just note here that this cartoon is something that actually comes from the linguistics literature, um, and in particular from a family of closely related representational theories uh, that are collectively referred to as dynamic semantics. So if you've seen Heim's file change semantics, if you've seen discourse representation theory, if you've seen dynamic predicate logic, you know, think of what we're doing here as uh, you know, some sort of relatively simplified uh, abstract notion of these kinds of things. Um, for an NLP audience in particular, I'll say that we often see discourse representation theory show up in the context of sort of discourse parsing applications where you're trying to name, uh, you know, coherence relations between individual sentences. Um, and I'll just say that that is not what we're doing here. We're really focused on the sort of model theoretic aspect of, uh, of DRT or of any of these theories. Um, right, so, you know, th this is a lot of notation, but just to summarize, we're going to think of uh, modeling the state of the world described by a discourse, by a sequence of sentences. We're going to think of the meaning of each sentence uh, as corresponding to an update to this discourse. And what this means is that if models that are sort of doing language processing are building representations of meaning, what we expect is to find representations of the state of the world that look sort of like this one hidden somewhere inside these models. Uh, right, and why might we expect this to, to be something that, that models for language processing do? Well, you can certainly imagine that if you had access to a structured representation of the state of the world that looked like this one, um, this language modeling problem, right, this problem of figuring out what sentences are going to come next uh, becomes much easier. If I want to know whether Jack will get a top is a plausible sentence to follow these other sentences that we had before, it's much easier for me to do this if I can reason directly about the current state of the world as opposed to trying to reason about sort of surface statistics that relate the sentence Jack will get a top uh, to all of the other sentences that we have up there. Um, you know, so there's reason to believe that these kinds of structured meaning representations, structured world states might be useful for language modeling. Um, on the other hand, it's clearly not the case uh, that these kinds of, um, you know, big transformer LMs like we were looking at a couple of slides back um, are literally building graph structures uh, like this one, um, you know, most basically for the reason that there's nowhere to put them, right? They're just sort of building like stacks of vector representations on vector representations. Um, and so there isn't any kind of explicit graph we can get our hands on. Um, and so what we're gonna try to do instead is find sort of implicit representations of these graphs, implicit representations of these world states uh, hidden somewhere inside these vector representations. Um, before we do that, I wanna pause briefly for questions about sort of how the, the representational framework uh, works uh, before we get into the machine learning details. So Jacob has asked whether the audience has any questions. So uh, if you have a question or um, 
some clarity needed about uh, the representation structure, uh, please do ask. Thanks. I think everyone's uh, well, on board, not, so uh, let's I'll go wait. ahead. Um, good. Okay. So, how is it that we're going to find these kinds of uh, representations of the state of the world inside one of these big language models? Um, so to sort of set things up, the basic paradigm that we're going to use here uh, is we're going to take some sort of encoder decoder model, and we're going to be looking at both BART and T5 models trained just on text, right, that takes as input a bunch of preceding pet sentences and generates as output uh, a distribution over the sentences that could come next. We're then going to take a data set of sentences, you know, either generated by this model or annotated sort of on their own. Um, and we're going to ask some sort of human annotator post hoc to label these sentences or label sort of pieces of these discourses with the underlying world states that they represent. So for a passage like you see a locked door, you are holding its key, you unlock the door. Um, we're going to have somebody, we're going to assume that we have access to a sort of ground truth representation of the state of the world as it exists at the end of this discourse uh, that's been generated for us by some sort of expert annotator. Um, importantly, we are not going to use these to train these models. These models are already trained just to do text processing. We're going to freeze their weights and only use these, uh, these state representations uh, for analysis. And what we're basically going to try to do is see if we can read these state representations off of the vector representations that are being computed by these uh, language models that we have on the left side of the screen. So, you know, if you've seen other work on probing uh, in, in natural language processing models, this is a version of that probing paradigm where what we're trying to get out are not just, you know, sort of features identifying uh, parts of speech or parse trees or whatever, but actually these whole world states. Um, right, so, so put it another way, we're going to train some other probing model that'll try to extract its graphs. We're going to need a uh, couple of different pieces to do this. Um, you know, the first thing is that these graphs are structured objects, uh, and so rather than trying to decode them all at once, we're going to try to decode them one edge at a time. So we're going to build some probing model that basically takes in a representation um, of a sort of single logical proposition encoded by one of these graphs, like the fact that the door is locked or the fact that you are holding the key. And we're going to try to judge for every such proposition, whether its value is true, whether its value is false, or whether its value cannot be determined based on uh, the text that has come before. And in this case, uh, it is true that the door is locked because we haven't yet unlocked it in the, in the discourse that has come before. Um, okay, and so what we need to do now is specify the components of this classifier that's going to take as input our representations from a model, our representation of a proposition, and to produce a truth value. Uh, the first thing that we need to figure out how to do here is to how to encode uh, logical propositions, how to encode pieces of this graph. Um, and to do that, we're going to do something super simple, which is we're just going to come up with sort of stringy representations of these logical propositions. We're going to encode them with the same encoder that comes from our language model itself, and that'll give us a sort of vector value representation uh, of a logical proposition of a piece of this graph, like the statement, the door is locked. And you know, again, importantly, we're going to do this even for sort of sentences for propositions uh, that don't appear in the passage. The next thing we need is some sort of representation to feed as the model representation into this probing model. Um, and we're going to play with a couple of different ways of uh, extracting these representations. Uh, but generically, think of this as we're going to take sort of all of the word representations, all the contextual word representations computed by our encoder. Um, and when I have a proposition that relates to a particular entity, I'm going to extract the contextual representation of the first mention of that entity in one of these discourses, right? So if I want to figure out whether the door is locked, I'm going to try to read that fact off of the first mention of the door in this passage. And so we're going to call this piece of our model the localizer. Um, and it's you know, going to find the contextual word representation relevant to the particular classification decision I'm trying to make right now. And finally, uh, we need some way of implementing this classifier. Uh, and we are going to sort of actually predict this distribution over true, false, true, false, unknown values with a linear model, or in this case, a bilinear model, right? So I'm going to fit a single weight matrix uh, that takes as input number one, 
a representation of a proposition as input number two, uh, a representation from inside my language model and just tries to map these uh, to outputs. And this is the only piece of the model, the only set of free parameters that we're actually going to train using these ground truth state representations that we had before. So we're leaving the weights of the model frozen, the encoder and the localizer have no free parameters, and there's just a single matrix right. that's going to define this readoff here. Um, right, and so it's, this is important because basically this, the extent to which we can say uh, that what we're actually finding is a representation that was already inside this model, as opposed to something that we've sort of learned to do using this extra, extra supervision off to the side, is going to depend on us using a classifier that isn't actually powerful enough to do any semantic inference on its own. Um, and by using a linear model here, what we're saying is that if we're able to pull off, pull out these uh, sort of structured state representations from our models, uh, this is because those state representations are already linearly encoded by the representations computed by the language model itself. Okay, um, and this is basically the entire sort of methodology that we're gonna use for finding this, right? We have a way of encoding propositions, encoding pieces of these world representations. We have a way of localizing those propositions within language model representations. And we have a very, very simple model that's trained to predict the truth or falsity of these rep uh, propositions based on the representations from our models. Um, and the next question that we have to ask is just, how well can we actually do this? Can we actually train a linear model like this to recover representations of the state of the world from representations inside these models? To evaluate this question, we're gonna look at two different data sets where we have access to ground truth information about the state of the world. The first data set that we're gonna look at here is uh, the alchemy data set, which I think was first introduced by Kelvin Gu. Um, and you know, involves a sequence of uh, sort of operations on uh, beakers full of colored liquids like we're showing at the left, right? So you have sentences like pour the last green beaker into beaker two, then into the first and mix. And you can see that as we're doing this, the underlying representation or the underlying state of the world described by these sentences changes, right? The contents of the second beaker changes and then the first beaker uh, and the ultimate result of this discourse is that the first beaker contains brown liquid. But if you only knew this initial state and you saw all of these sentences, rather, if you only knew the initial state and you saw all these sentences, you could predict that the final beaker was going to be brown, even though the word brown or the statement the first beaker is brown appears nowhere in this text. And so these are the kinds of phenomena that we're going to be looking at in, uh, in the world of alchemy. Uh, the other data set that we're going to be using for evaluation is the text world data set. Uh, this is a data set of playthroughs through text adventure games released by a group at Microsoft. Um, and again, normally people actually use this for evaluating gameplay. Um, and here we're going to turn it into a language modeling da data set by just sampling sort of random playthroughs of this game and then asking the model to predict what it knows about the state of the world based on the text uh, that it's sort of seen this player uh, produce so far. And this text world data set has a lot more interesting relational structure, uh, requires agents to read or models to be able to reason about sort of the accessibility of objects, what's in the room with you right now, the affordances of objects, you know, what can you use a key for, what can you do with a chest, uh, what can you do with a chest when it's locked or, clo or, or open, uh, and things like that. So two pretty different data sets. Uh, that are going to let us answer different kinds of questions about uh, how well these models do. And with these two data sets in hand, uh, we can ask the sort of basic question we started with, which is how well can you actually do at this probing task? Um, and so here we're comparing both a BART sequence to sequence model and a T5 sequence to sequence model um, on the alchemy and the text world data sets. And what we're looking at is at the, end, at the level of individual entities, right? At the level of sort of beaker number one or the chest that's in the room, how often can we completely recover the state of that entity? Both all the things that we know to be true about it and all the things that we know to, know to be false about it, uh, just based on these language model representations alone. And you can see that with both the BART and the T5 model in this alchemy domain, you get about 75% of entities exactly right. In the text world domain, you do even better. You get about 95, 96% of entities exactly right. And to put these numbers in context, 
uh, we can compare to a couple of baselines, one in which we assume that objects never change their state throughout a discourse, and where we just sort of try to read their states off the initial mentions without modeling any of the rest of the text. Um, and another baseline in which we assume that every kind of object is just always in the most frequent state for objects of that kind, and we don't look at the text at all. And you can see that in both cases, uh, these two baselines do substantially worse, uh, although, you know, in the case of text world in particular, still pretty well in an absolute sense, uh, and in a way that probably explains our performance uh, on text world relative to alchemy. But so the important takeaway here is just that most entity states can be recovered exactly from representations of mentions of those entities inside language models that were just trained on text alone. And this includes information about entity state, like the fact that this final beaker in this alchemy discourse is brown, which is never mentioned by the text. Okay, and now that we've got that out of the way, we can start to ask more interesting questions about what exactly is going on, uh, both how it is that these models are coming to build these representations um, and what exactly those representations look like uh, inside these models. Okay, so question number one, uh, what kind of training uh, is responsible for producing these representations? So one detail that I didn't mention on the previous slide is that we started with big pre-trained language models, uh, you know, trained on sort of open domain internet text, the standard data for T5 and BART, um, and then we fine tuned them uh, on each of these domains, right? So we had an alchemy specific model that we fine tuned on a language modeling task on the alchemy data set and another one that we fine tuned to do language modeling on text world. Um, and those were the numbers that we saw in the previous slide. However, if we don't fine tune at all and we just, you know, sort of use the initial parameterizations of these models as we get them from training on the entire internet, um, our success at this probing task only decreases by a very little bit, by, you know, one or 2%, uh, I guess 3% in each of these cases. Um, and conversely, if we start with a randomly initialized version of one of these models and we still fine tune it on these underlying data sets uh, and, you know, give them sort of task specific fine tuning, uh, we find that performance is a lot worse. And what this says is that most of the success at uh, this probing task, right? Most of the of our ability to discover representations of the state of the world in these models is attributable not to um, data set specific fine tuning, not to sort of you know really specific modeling of the specific phenomena that show up in these data sets, but instead general and in particular large scale pre training schemes. Okay, the next question that we're gonna ask here um, is how this information is actually organized within these models. Um, so we mentioned before that this sort of localizer component of our probe was going to look at the first mention of the entities involved in propositions as we were trying to read them off. Um, and we can actually play around with that by pointing this localizer component at different pieces of the sentence to try to figure out where information about each entity is stored. Uh, for example, we can take this probe uh, and when we're trying to figure out the state of the third beaker, we can point it only at the word has in this sort of first description of the third beaker. Uh, and there we can recover the speaker state with 64% accuracy. Or we can point this like localizer, you know, at the digit four, in which case we can recover this state with 66% accuracy. We can point it with, at blue and recover it with 67% accuracy um, and so on. Um, and the main thing to notice here is that, first of all, uh, we do much better at recovering the state of this entity from the sentence that mentions that entity the first time. And if we try to point this localizer, you know, at descriptions of other beakers, like the word the fourth on the slide, we do much worse at this probing task. Um, so information about entities really is local to mentions of those entities. Um, and it turns out it doesn't really mention whether, or it doesn't really matter whether you point this localizer at the first mention or the last mention, or you average all the mentions together, um, as long as you pointed at tokens that describe the entity as it was in some state during the discourse, you can recover the final state of that entity at the end of the discourse. And what this, the sort of picture that this paints um, is something like the following. Uh, the, the way in which these, uh, representations of the state of the world are encoded is something like this. Every time an entity gets mentioned, 
all of the contextual word representations around that entity serve as a sort of repository of all of the facts that we know to be true about that entity. And if we append sentences to the discourse, like you open the door, then all of the mentions of the door everywhere in the discourse are going to have their representations updated to reflect that new fact that we now know about the door. And this includes both the thing describing the change and all of the mentions of the door that preceded the change. You know, so we can think of there as being like a little sort of box full of facts about entities uh, that sit above every entity inside these language model representations. Um, and what's nice about this picture is that it's literally a picture from one of these original papers on uh, dynamic semantics, right? So this is a figure out of, the, of uh, Irene Heim's file change semantics card where the sort of theory of uh, discourse representation that she's proposing is one that looks exactly like this, right? Where we have these little file cards. Uh, we know that there's an entity one that's a woman and was bitten by two and hit two. Um, and this seems to actually be the kinds of representations that our language models are. Uh, Producing, right? So, you know, we have this like decades old formal theory from linguistics that seems to have predicted how information is going to get organized in modern language models. And what this picture suggests um, is one more experiment that we can run here uh, to like really probe the extent to which what we're figuring out is a representation that the model is using to do language modeling um, and not just you know some sort of features that are spuriously correlated with features of the text but aren't actually important for model behavior. Um, so what we're specifically going to do is, uh, is this. We're going to construct two discourses that are very similar but pick out slightly different final states for the world. In particular, we're going to construct one discourse that we're going to call C1, whose final consequence is that the first speaker is empty. And we're going to construct another discourse that we're going to call C2, whose final consequence is that the first speaker is full, but the second speaker is empty. And if this picture of how language models work is right, uh, you know, if the sort of information about the state of the first speaker lives in all mentions of the first speaker and the second mention, second speaker lives in all mentions of the second speaker, then we should be able to do the following. We should be able to take the first mention of the first speaker from C1 and the mention, the first mention of the second speaker from C2 and sort of paste these things together into, uh, you know, basically a, a made up uh, output from a transformer encoder that doesn't actually correspond to any input text that you could actually produce, right? So we've sort of taken the representation of beaker two from C2 and we've, used, we've replaced uh, the representation of beaker two in C1. And if this picture that we painted before is right, then what this should now describe is a state of the world in which the first beaker is empty and the second beaker is empty, but the third beaker is still full. And so in particular, what we expect is that we will generate um, if we take this, this fake representation that we produced and we hand it off to the language model decoder, we expect to get generation in which uh, we say things that are consistent with, uh, with this state of the world that we have on the right, right? Where the third beaker uh, can be emptied. So we say things like empty the third beaker, but the second beaker cannot be stirred because the second beaker is empty. So we don't say stir the red beaker. And if we do this, if we actually sort of measure uh, what happens if we take this copy pasted representation and we hand it off to the language model decoder, we find that this actually happens, right? So, you know, close to 80% of generations that we get uh, from the decoder in this new context we produced are consistent with the state of the world that we described on the right. Um, and, you know, conversely, if you take uh, generations in C1 or generations in C2, uh, those are not in general consistent with uh, the world state that we had on the left. And so what this suggests is that these representations that we're finding um, are in fact causally implicated in the model's decision-making process, right? That we can sort of uh, manipulate these structured representations of the state of the world and have those manipulations produce predictable effects on downstream language generation. Okay, 
Um, so this has been all the good news, right? That we do sort of reasonably well in an absolute sense of this probing task. We have, you know, nice tall bars that are close to 90% here. Uh, we have this cool one-off intervention experiment that shows uh, that we can actually do sort of structural manipulation of these models. Um, and what I want to talk about in the time uh, that we have left in this talk is just what's still missing from the picture that we've painted so far. Um, and I think the biggest thing that's missing from this picture is uh, the ability to attribute errors in these models to errors in the underlying world representations. Um, so, you know, if you plot sort of the probability in a given context uh, of a given uh, proposition being recovered accurately by this probe versus the probability that a random sample from this model is actually semantically acceptable, um, these things are basically not correlated at all. Right. And so what this suggests is that uh, models, to the extent that they're making errors, are not necessarily making errors that result from errors in the underlying world state. Um, you know, and this could either be because our probe is not actually powerful enough to extract uh, the world as the model sees it, and that you know there are sort of better world states hidden in there that we just don't have the ability to pull out, or that um, you know, in fact, some fraction of the time the model is not actually paying attention to these structured state representations, um, and that most of the errors result from those kinds of situations. Another thing uh, that would be great to add to these accounts, of course, is sort of more detailed descriptions of semantic phenomena. Um, and in particular, within the linguistics literature, uh, you know, the sort of main thing, the main set of questions that these theories of dynamic semantics aim to answer are tricky cases of quantification and, you know, sort of complicated things that go on when, uh, you know, say you say like every person who has a boat sails it and quantifier scope and, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, we haven't said anything about quantification today. We've been assuming that there's only one of any given type of object in the world in these probing experiments. Um, and, you know, I think there would be lots of interesting things to do looking at what happens when you say things like, uh, most and what pieces of representations get modified in what ways by complicated quantifiers like most. Um, and, you know, we can extend this to an even broader range of semantic phenomena, things like logical implication and counterfactuals uh, that we expect would really stress models reasoning abilities and are probably actually, you know, not in scope uh, for current language models. Um, and another important point to make here uh, is, you know, to go back to the one at the beginning of the talk, which is that even though we're doing really well at this probing task, these language models are still not actually perfect models of discourse coherence, right? And when you sample from them, even in these like extremely restricted domains, like this alchemy domain, um, you know, 15 to 20% of the time, the next sentence that comes out of the model is not something that's actually semantically acceptable in context. Um, and, you know, so in some sense, the, the success of the probing task seems to happen in spite of uh, models ability to actually sort of do coherent generation rather than as a result of models ability to do coherent generation. Uh, we are still living in a world where language models are very much not uh, perfect models of language. Um, and what this suggests is that we should be able to take some of the insights from these probing experiments and use it to actually now come up with better grounded training schemes for these models that improve the quality of, uh, of their predictions. Um, and so we've done just like a very little bit of work uh, in this area. These experiments are super preliminary, but basically suggesting that if you add as an auxiliary task to your training objective, not just language modeling, but also prediction of uh, these world states, basically if you back crop through the probe, uh, that not only improves your success at the probing task, but actually gives you more coherent generation from these models. So training them to predict these grounded world states uh, makes them better language models. Uh, you know, in other words, grounded training really does improve language modeling abilities, uh, which I think shouldn't come as a surprise, uh, but is not something that uh, seems to be widely done in, uh, in, in BART type models right now. Um, you know, we can do even fancier things, right? You can imagine building language models that are actually not just as an auxiliary loss, but at test time, uh, explicitly 
reasoning about distributions over possible states of the world. Um, and this also seems to buy you a little bit of language modeling performance. So if you treat these world states as latent variables, you infer them during training, and then you marginalize over them uh, when you're doing predictions with your language model, uh, you can get still further gains uh, on top of what we were looking before. So grounded supervision helps, uh, and having sort of actual simulation inside these models and actual prediction of grounded world, state, world states uh, seems like it helps even a little bit more. Um, good, and I think I will actually wrap up there and leave time for questions. Uh, but just to summarize this talk, um, it seems to be the case that big neural language models trained just on next word prediction tasks produce representations of the state of the world representations of the sort of properties and relations shared by individual entities. Um, and these state representations uh, can, you know, in some cases even be sort of manipulated and stitched together in new ways, in ways that predictably affect the behavior of model decoders. Um, at the same time, it is both the case that the probe and the language model itself that we're studying uh, is not 100% reliable. Um, and there are lots of interesting open questions about what exactly, uh, you know, in, in the realm of more complicated semantic phenomena is captured by these models um, and how we can actually use these insights to make language models better. Um, and, you know, finally, I'll just note that all of the work uh, I've been talking about today is, is really due to the student authors on this paper, Belinda Lee and Max Nye. Um, and yeah, and with that, I will wrap up and, uh, and take questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob, for his wonderful talk. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't see a question in the chat. So maybe, uh, so maybe uh, any questions from the audience, you can unmute yourself and ask. OK, so um, yeah, so maybe uh, I, I can go first. Uh, so um, I have a couple of questions. So first, um, I mean, uh, this is uh, actually very exciting uh, findings. I, I actually wonder, uh, I'm actually wondering, uh, have you ever tried to use, uh, try this in more real world texts, uh, such as news or news articles or like, uh, uh, yeah, because I, I, I saw that your, in your experiments, you, you used a, a text board and uh, uh, another one, which is more uh, artificial. I mean, um, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so the reason we use the data sets that we're using right here is because, you know, basically they were designed for NLP tasks and so we already have access to these structured state representations. Uh, there aren't big corpora of corresponding state representations for, uh, for things like news articles out there. Uh, and so, you know, there wasn't, wasn't an easy way to do this, but, uh, you know, this is certainly something that we should do. And, you know, I, like David McAllister always says, you know, if you pick up the newspaper, like any paragraph that you're looking at is not going to describe, you know, bottles of colored liquid or chairs moving around in a room or whatever, you know, it's going to talk about things like um, democracy and imagination and false belief. And, uh, you know, these things are much more complicated to reason about who knows if their representations actually look anything like the representations that we've been talking about today. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the short answer to your question is I don't know. And the long answer is I hope at some point that we can actually, even in a relatively narrow way, um, build some of these uh, ground truth state representations in a way that would let us run this probing experiment on, on more realistic data sets. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the other question is like, um, uh, I mean, uh, do we think that uh, this work is, uh, I mean, I have some connections with natural language inference because I think uh, uh, in your probing task, uh, like uh, queries for work states, I think it's a special case of uh, like the hypothesis of in the natural language inference. Uh, so, do, so, so do you think uh, in your experiment, uh, do, uh, do you think uh, it actually shows that uh, the uh, pre-trained language models already have some pre-encoded ability for the NLI task, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that, that is another great question, right? So specifically, you can think of this probe uh, as doing exactly a sort of like narrow but exhaustive version of natural language inference where you're testing all of the 
like all of the atomic statements uh, that are coherent with an entire discourse. Um, and I think the main difference between what we're doing here and you know what an LI understood it as an NLP task does really just has to do with what the data set looks like that our uh, sort of premises are paragraph size, they're long, they're complicated. Uh, they describe a bunch of changes that you have to reason about in sequence and our hypotheses are comparatively simple. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically we're using that machinery. Probably if we wanted to, we could use models from that literature to give us better probes with some danger of, you know, then having those just like learn to do the semantic inference themselves. But what this suggests is that, you know, for a, um, a particular version of the NLI task, you can do pretty well with uh, a very, very simple model that just takes, looks at like similarity between word embeddings under, uh, under a single linear transformation. And I think this is actually something that, you know, like way back in the day when people started to do NLI with neural models, that was found to be a pretty strong baseline for, um, uh, for NLI was just like encode sentence A, encode sentence B and take a dot product. Can I go next? Hi. Uh, I... Thank you. Uh, okay, I, I saw another question in the chat from uh, Dong Zhen. Uh, maybe you can mute yourself. Uh, oh. uh, go ahead. First. Uh, I... Hey, uh, hear me? I cannot hear you very clearly. Can you guys hear me? Uh, I, I want to ask a question. It seems like I can, my I can hear you. So you saw why don't you go? Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jacob. Very nice to see you today. Uh, so my question is more on the problem formulation of your paper. So you know you're assuming a proposition based problem formalization that everything is binary, right? True or false? Have you thought about you know more complex problem formalization like? there's not so much true or false or something, I mean, in degree, right? So just like we have uh, talked previously, is Boston very hot today? So the answer might not be just hot or not hot, maybe something in between, but a little bit hot, right? So do you think, can your framework be generalized more into a more complex formalization than simple proposition? Thank you, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, also an excellent question. I mean, there are lots of ways that people uh, formalize uncertainty and gradedness in these contexts. You know, there's fuzzy logics, there's probabilistic logics. Um, this probing paradigm, you could plug into any of those. And I think it's just a question of whether you can get um, state representations that, uh, um, that allow you to build such a probe. And, you know, sort of relating to the previous question, um, some of this has to do with uh, uh, with like what it means for a fact to be entailed by a discourse, right? You can imagine even, you know, sort of training this model in this way, if you just have a true false distinction, that what you actually get out is the probability that proposition A is true given everything that's come before. And that could, you know, here it's always deterministic, but that could in fact be a graded phenomenon. And you could imagine treating the outputs of this probe as, um, as you know, subjective probability estimates. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Jacob. This is uh, Steven. Thanks for the presentation. I have a follow-up follow, follow uh, question after uh, Yisong. My question is uh, regarding, the, regarding the evaluation. Um, so, uh, in your slides, you have shown the the the, data, the result of uh all chemi uh data set, and uh, in terms of uh, accuracy, my question is uh is this uh, automatically evaluated or is manually evaluated, because it seems that it can be a bit challenging to uh to quantify what can be inferred from the uh what are uh, what are the plausible uh hidden meanings of the sentences.
Uh, yeah, that's um, so in uh, now I have to remind myself. So in alchemy, the discourses are constructed so that you always know in principle, you always know exactly the final state uh, if you cut it off after any sentence. So the model always knows the initial beaker setup, like there's a sentence at the beginning that just says beaker one is two units of red, beaker two has three units of green. Um, and then with those, you can use the existing annotations in the alchemy data set to evaluate things automatically. Um, for text world, that is not the case. And for text world, you know, the whole point of a text adventure game is you have some initial uncertainty about the state of the world. And so there, um, Belinda, I, so we experimented both with um, just having a rule-based model that looks at the history so far. And because you know the simulator, you should know what things, you know, have been observed and not been observed by the user. Um, and also a learned version of that model that just like trains on uh, lots and lots and lots of grounded supervision to predict what's available from a given discourse or not. Uh, and I think they'll both perform comparably well. Um, but yeah, so in alchemy, there's no uh, values that are unknown. And in text world, we have other models that are sitting off to the side that are computing you know, basically what the value of every proposition should be in this three-valued logic. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I saw uh, another one, uh, like raise your hand. Uh, can you like unmute yourself? Hi, uh, Peter, thank you for your talk. Uh, I've just got a very more rather pragmatic question, which is, I think building on, on the previous questions, if we were to kind of extend this to more generalizable text, like say news example, would the memory or computational footprint increase uh, exponentially for to, to kind of like track all these entity states? Uh, would it be feasible? Yeah, well, and so this is, I mean, you know, in general, right, if you ask about what's the set of things that are consistent with the world described by a discourse, even in these little micro domains, that's infinite, right? That, you know, you could ask about uh, various different kinds of shades of red of the beaker and there are different ways of asking whether something is empty and there are all kinds of like, you know, quantified propositions, you know, you could ask is the second or the third beaker empty um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I don't think it is ever going to be the case that we can actually uh, or that the right way to think about these problems is uh, to enumerate um, every edge that might be in the graph that somehow represents the underlying state of a discourse, but that instead, you know, for a given semantic phenomenon of interest, uh, we just probe for the sort of propositions that are relevant to that. And, you know, here in these initial experiments, we could do that relatively easily because um, uh, you know, these worlds are very small. There's not actually that much that can go on semantically. Once we get into the real world and real text, we'll have to be a little bit more uh, selective or sophisticated about how we actually build these graphs that we probe for. Okay, yeah. Uh... We have another question from the chart. Uh, okay, I can read it for you. Uh, so uh, is the model built manually for particular tasks? Uh, I, I, uh, if yes, how many efforts are needed to build a model for different piece of text? Uh, yeah, that's a question. Yeah, so I guess uh, I like methodologically the, the history of this project was we did everything in text world and then the, or rather everything in alchemy and the text world experiments appeared a week and a half before the deadline, something like that. So um, in that sense, it seems like this model is pretty generic and probably doesn't need to be, uh, you know, at least the architecture of this probe is not something that I would expect would need to change uh, if we wanted to, to do these experiments in different domains. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe he wants to, uh, he, he's asking about uh, like, when, when you, uh, when, when you test your model uh, with your semantic prompts, you, you need to manually write those uh, claims, uh, right? Uh, 
Is that right? Oh, yeah. So I think this is related to the previous question, which is like, what is the set of uh, propositions that you probe for? Uh, and yes, that's something that you need to do manually. I think not in a data set specific way, but in a theory specific way. So for whatever phenomenon you're actually interested in, you need some way of, uh, of formalizing how that phenomenon gets written down. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, Taha, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, thanks, Lenny. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jacob, for the great talk. And I was wondering if you uh, if you tried to probe the language model to understand if uh, if it has a quantitative understanding uh, of the uh, of the environment. Like I, I know you already did it. Like uh, is the is the chest empty? But what I'm really curious about is so let's say the chest has five apples and you take out two and then you probe for three apples inside the chest. Does the model like understand it and can give the correct answer? Have you ever tried that? Yeah, no, we haven't done that yet. And I, I think that's like one of the most important next questions here is, you know, I guess there, there, there's two pieces of this, right? There's sort of, can you do quantitative reasoning about the state of the world, even when the sort of actual events don't involve numbers? And then can you deal with uh, language that itself involves complex quantification? And, and I don't know the answer to either of those questions. <laughs> I see. Yeah, and may, maybe another uh, question is, uh, have you tried the ambiguous cases actually? So let's say the chest has two apples and you get out four apples and then you probe the model for, is the chest empty, right? So did, did you try those kind of cases? Where, what, what does the model do? I, I guess that even a human uh, would be uh, not really correct in that saying the chest is empty, but that's at least what I would be expect from the model. So. Have you think about it or try Yeah, to... so I guess I'm not exactly sure what you mean by ambiguity. We certainly mm -hmm. do, especially in text world, have cases where the value of a proposition is just not determined by the text that came before, and then the model is being trained to output a, an I don't know value. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay, there's an unknown name as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, and I guess one one important qualifier I'll say there is that you know you can have language like uh, or or one could in principle have sentences like there is either an apple or an orange in the chest. And the way we have these experiments set up right now, all the model needs to predict is I don't know about the apple and I don't know about the orange. You know, the same as if we'd said nothing about the contents of the chest. You actually do know more, um, but. Uh, you then need to probe for more complicated logical forms than we're looking at here. So that that would be another natural extension of this. Okay. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if no, then uh, let's unmute and uh, give a round of applause for uh, Jacob's wonderful talk today. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, we will still have some uh, open discussions. Uh, so uh, if anyone who is interested and want to have a chat, uh, please stay. Uh, okay, uh, 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 otherwise, uh, like, uh, uh, the I think the seminar is the end of today. Yeah. Great, thank, thank you so much for having me. It's thank great you. to be here <laughs> in, in one form or another. I'm just gonna grab a glass of water. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. sure.